I honestly, I've seen listings just, you know, an autopilot business for you, you know, one K a month recurring revenue. Again, autopilot could be ran for like five years. No need to touch it. Defensible business model, strong motor. Like as an example, right? If that turns out to be true and that's the start of the listing, man, competition and bidding for that is going to be crazy. And back to the strategic acquisitions front. Yes, strategic pays better, but finding a strategic buyer may or may not happen. It may not be the right time. They may not be looking or anything. You know, it can take 12, 18, 24 months to find a strategic buyer versus a traditional financial deal closing in three to six months. Hey there, Kristen Jacobson here. So here's a fun but sad fact for us. Most of the people that love our show are still not subscribed to our channel. Now, here is the deal that I'm gonna make with you. If you can find it in your heart to click the subscribe button, I promise you that we're gonna get better guests to provide more deeper insights and more practical steps in the online business m a space. So that's the deal. If you can hit the subscribe button and also put on the notifications, we'd be really, really grateful for that. And we'll make a better show for you moving forward. Now, I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. All right, Mario, welcome to the Digital Dealmakers uh, podcast, my friend. Hey, Jens, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Awesome, man. Well, um, let's uh, kick things off. So Mario um, is a pretty well seasoned uh, site acquirer and he's doing a lot of interesting things in the space. So, you know, hopefully uh, we, we're going to get a lot of value in hearing from his perspective on you know, what he really looks for in terms of acquiring a site and just some of the things that he's seen over the over the period that he's uh, been, been doing this. And um, yeah, really, really appreciate you jumping on, man. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've been around for, what is it, 14 years on Flip Power Show. So I've seen things go up and down at the same time. Different sorts of deals, different transactions, small and large sites, marketplaces, mm. publisher websites, commerce, Amazon, uh, agencies, newsletters even. So it's been a quite an interesting journey, at least in my perspective. So I'm more than happy to share more about that. I was going to say 14 years. That would have been like where you first started getting started when there was dial-up internet almost. <laughs> but... <laughs> When I was first getting started, uh, just, just for context, uh, we were still going to computer clubs to get you know, public internet access, and there was the dial-up yeah. modems, and we were like printing and saving things on floppy disks so that we can then print them and treat them at home, or like even going to a Xerox and copying over books together to cut the cost from a print per page cost, and uh, you know, it's been a significant journey. So 14 years is the more recent age, at least in my book. We always say that every year in this space is like a dog year. <laughs> so you've been doing it for more than 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Dom, let's kick things off. And I know you've got a couple of questions around, you know, what from a yeah. buyer's perspective, but also some value for like the seller uh, perspective. If someone is listening or watching this podcast that is looking to potentially you know, sell a content site, what things to really consider and get a buyer's perspective on it. Yeah, exactly. So I think for a bit of context, I met Mario in person probably two or three weeks ago now, but obviously heard a lot about him over the last six months or pretty much when I started at Flipper as a very active buyer and active entrepreneur. So, you know, who better to kind of bring on someone who is very experienced in the acquisition field in smaller businesses, but also larger businesses. Um, so I think it's really helpful for the sellers in our audience to really ask themselves um, throughout this episode some questions and have those answered. So Mario, um, I met you a couple of weeks ago in person uh, in Sofia in Bulgaria, uh, and obviously I've heard a lot about you over the last six months, 12 months working at Flipper, uh, because you've definitely been someone who's heavily involved in the online business community and certainly a serial acquirer. Um, right from smaller businesses through to larger businesses. And I thought it would be fantastic to have you on the podcast um, because I can imagine as a seller, you're very much interested in knowing, okay, what do these buyers want and what are these buyers looking for? And give your point of view of the types of businesses that you've acquired in the past. I believe it's 40, um, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, please tell us about that journey, that 14-year journey. Yeah, absolutely. So... 
uh, I'll probably start a little earlier, but uh, I built my first website back when I was probably nine years old. I was lucky to have a computer and uh, okay. endless spare time during summer vacation and all that. So I was spending 16 hours a day just lurking around and trying to build something, breaking windows and all that. Yeah. So that led me to some very early career opportunities in my teen days, working at uh, IT cafes, uh, uh, media networks, translating resources, including security news, managing forums and online sites and so forth. So I'd say I had a very early exposure to different types of businesses and media networks and publishers working with journalists, with very smart, creative product managers. And this was very inspirational. Not everyone has had that exposure. I fully realize that. So I'm trying to educate and share a lot of resources myself to just kind of give, give back the, the favor in a, in a sense. So. At some point, I was working as a software engineer. I spent several years in kind of enterprise software engineering, building lots of different things. And I switched to full-time freelancing in 2007, 2008, then founded my first business, uh, I think 2010. And throughout that kind of journey, um, I, I was aware of what a business looks like, what it represents, um, you know, how to launch a different kind of business models or so, but this, this kind of uh, kind of provided a very very specific insight for me as to what what I could deliver, but at the same time I wasn't necessarily able to get there by myself. Meaning mm-hmm. that starting from zero to the first customer, to the tenth customer, the fifteenth customer, was something that was extremely complicated. It required a lot of outreach, um, finding the right funnel, finding the right community, whatever it is. And time as well. I can imagine time. Time is a resource, so it probably also costs a lot of time. Yeah, most definitely. And and also builders, like engineers or or even marketers and and managers and people who are in an opportunity that they would they're able to build something or purchase something or pay someone to build something. It doesn't mean they can necessarily scale it, or they may not have access to that very right audience. So that's kind of how I stumbled upon Flippa. I found some starter websites to buy. Uh, They already had some uh, users, some resources, some subscribers, and they found it much easier to get something going with an existing user base or subscriber base as compared to starting from scratch and just begging for my first user, second, fifth, tenth user. Um, I I think this was kind of the the breaking moment. Then it, it kind of got sticky. Um, I did set up alerts on the site or whatever the uh, alerts version was over a decade ago, but I was tracking down specific search queries and like looking every week for is there something interesting? Is there a publishing website we can take and acquire and, and grow further? Is there a starter site that we can launch or test as an offer? Is there an outsourced solution that we can buy and just kind of add as a complementary service? And if it works, we would have outsourced resources to just test. And if it works for good, we can just kind of build it as an additional suite to whatever we offer. So that's kind of how we started. And yes, I do have over 40 acquisitions. Many of them are smaller uh, kind of starter sites or so, but some of them are, uh, I'd say, high five and six figure businesses uh, that we've you know, acquired internally and have also facilitated several deals in the low to mid six figures range myself with people around me, business partners, or people looking to acquire a, a similar business in that range. Okay, so back on the ranges. So has your kind of investment philosophy or growth philosophy always been, you know, acquire a business, for example, random numbers, $10,000 or $15,000, apply a playbook, a formula, increase the revenues and, and obviously the profitability, and then that business is worth, let's say, 100000 for example. Is that kind of the journey and playbook that you're exercising at the moment? This is one of the playbooks, yes. There are several yeah, okay. others as well. Um, yeah. One of them is using an external resource and adding it as an additional feature to an existing uh, set of solutions that we offer. Let's say we offer a marketing retainer that includes SEO and go-to-market strategies and whatever, right? And so we sell 20 of these on a monthly basis, but we can also acquire a tool that costs 10 grand. And yeah. we can generate reports through that too and sell them at you know, 500 bucks each. So we can literally pay this off in the first month by selling 20 licenses or 20 reports, 500 bucks each, 
and repay okay. for that too immediately from month one. So this is kind okay. of the strategic acquisition opportunity of kind of how we can get there. Yeah. In okay. other cases, we can also do, let's say we buy a publishing website that's in a specific niche and we work with clients in that niche. So we manage to land kind of sponsored, featured opportunities or guest posts or an interview or so like a PR story in a sense. And we do that for two or three clients, charge them whatever, a thousand bucks, 1500 each. And then we pay back for, I know, a third of the acquisition or so, again, within the first 60, 60 days, right? And then it kind mm, of makes Incredible. Okay, so, so you're also a, yeah, it sounds like, a, and I didn't know this really, a, a strategic acquirer as well. So, you know, with your agency business, you acquire tools or products, SaaS products, for example, which you can then acquire the product itself for an amount, and then you like to, um, you know, to, and it's obviously useful for your clients to better the experience and your effect and your impact for your clients. You can also then on sell that. Okay, that's that's really interesting. And and do you ever look to um, those products? Um, do you have like in-house uh, functions and uh, capabilities within your agency or team which can maintain these products or SaaS businesses, or do you outsource that work? Yeah. So as an agency, it's easier for us to maintain internally. In some cases, we do a mixed model. We either partner up with a business that's capable and is able to do that, or work with freelancers, consultants, contractors as needed. Or in some cases, with the acquisitions, we get access to uh, people who have maintained the product. Meaning, in some cases, we speak to a seller, and they are a business person, right? But they work with a developer on a freelance basis or on a contract basis, whatever it is, and say, hey, I'm going to share the contacts with the developer. You can keep working with them. They charge whatever hourly rate or so. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. very interesting. On that point, um, when it comes to it, so it's, it, it sounds like a few of these like acquisitions that you've made is sort of, you know, as you said, starter sites or something that's, you know, sort of just seeding. In terms of uh, valuation, you know, because the standard is like uh, EBITDA times a certain multiple, but I mean, do you have a different like viewpoint on you know, on valuing a, a business that like might be a really good fit that you can easily like just get an ROI on and would be, you know, sort of willing to pay above what the standard market rate is, or do you go in like and, and treat it the same way um, as a as a, you know as a standard um, valuation I'd like to get your perspective on that yeah absolutely so I, I generally divide the types of acquisitions in two categories strategic mm -hmm. and financial when it comes to financial it's more conservative so yes it is EBITDA by a certain multiplier for the category depending on the times you live in and investment opportunities and how competitive the market is this is kind of the traditional playbook for financial when I take a look at an opportunity as a financial buyer, I know that they don't necessarily have a competitive edge, right? They don't have direct contacts or a network I can plug in uh, that could directly, you know, skyrocket this and so forth. So it's just a good deal that I can pick up and I expect this to keep going in the same uh, pace for the next 18 months or so and then, you know, reach a break even and then we can think of any form of profitability. That's a very, uh, back of the napkin type of nap as a financial investment. As a strategic investment, again, similarly to, to the previous considerations, in some cases we are just able to, to um, you know, bring and infuse additional resources or contacts or network or plant portfolio or show, which would justify having a product and making it worthwhile. Um, one example for an acquisition, there was a kind of bubble product for, I think, 10 grand uh, generating images and having kind of an AI image generator. So we had a couple of clients that just required image assets. So if we went with our designer, it would be like, let's say generating 20 images costs whatever, uh, two grand or three grand or whatever it is, right? With some back and forth and so on. And he said we could use the two and generate 50 and let the client pick 20. And it's going to cost us like five bucks, 10 bucks. And we have a library to keep building on and so forth. So that's, a, again, a clear example of one single client, one opportunity. We speed up the process. We save internal resources. And we can actually make more money and keep doing that. You know, same goes for we acquired a WordPress plugin for eighteen dollars or $20,000. It paid back in fourteen, 
and it was entirely on autopilot. It required probably two to three hours a week of support and some very light development combined. So it was pretty much an autopilot. Even if you don't have the resource, you can work with a freelancer, go on Codable or whatever it is. And it was just a passive income type of thing. It, it had SEO working. It had a freemium plugin on WordPress.org that was ranking well and getting free users. A portion of them were converting and so forth. So that's another example uh, of that. So again, different situations, some are more financial, some are more strategic, and we apply different playbooks depending on uh, how quickly we believe we can get a return on investment. And we also always consider the build versus buy. Like if we build it, how long would it take? How complex it is? How long would it take to reach that customer base if we were starting from scratch? So in terms of like, I mean, a lot of the sellers that I speak to that are believing that they could find a strategic acquirer, do you find, I mean, do you generally see that these people that are, you know, sort of would be a good strategic fit for you, do they already kind of know that they could be a strategic fit or they don't really know and then you, you know, sort of like highlight that the reason for strategic acquisition like how do you navigate that when because a lot of the time um sellers that are trying to you know sell on potential or a strategic acquisition usually really outprice themselves um, for for a potential buyer so like how do you navigate that and like what do you generally see that might uh, some sellers might make you know mistakes around or misconceptions around in that sense Look, I know you guys are much more experienced in that uh, compared to me because you work with buyers and sellers and both of them have completely unrealistic expectations and you just need to bridge the gap and kind of- Well, you gotta bridge the gap, the exactly. Gap. That's the challenge. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, it, it's kind of common and I, and I understand that. We, so first off, also sell some properties, not too many, just a handful, but you know, some of them were in the six figures and they know how in some cases, you invest seven figures and then you exit for six figures and it's not fun. Or, you know, you pour in, uh, we have a product, we've spent over 4,000 development hours internally. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, it's, it's costing many, many, many tens of thousands or like over $100,000 internally in just like sheer engineering effort, but we couldn't scale it properly. And in terms of a product, because it's generating almost no revenue. If you take a look at the pure EBITDA basis, uh, it's probably going to cost a thousand bucks, right? So what's realistic and how much effort you've put in? Yeah, what's don't reasonable. Really have a lot in common. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. And yeah, so both buyers and sellers should be aware of that consideration. But uh, but again, the, the truth is somewhere in between, right? So in that SaaS case that I mentioned that we spent a ton of time, uh, it's not generating significant revenue so it's it's not really a helpful cash cow and we invest a lot of time so if you take a look from a purely financial standpoint EBITDA wise it probably costs a thousand bucks or two thousand three thousand however if you want to build it it's still going to cost you thirty thousand or four thousand yeah I mean it, it's interesting because like a, a lot of sellers just um you know, what what I've experienced in in my time of uh, helping uh, sellers is that you know, effectively, I'm looking out for red flag keywords such as like, um, this business has got plenty of potential or I'm looking for a strategic buyer, which generally means um, EBITDA is not there, <laughs> but they've built something. And, you know, and in some cases, they have actually built something that has some value for the right type of uh, buyer. But in most cases... It's just that they think that, you know, having a thousand, you know, a thousand email subscribers for a particular niche that they can somehow charge like, you know, essentially like 10 bucks, a, 10 bucks a lead when someone could easily just get the, uh, a list of email subscribers for like, you know, two bucks. So it doesn't even really make sense, but yeah it's just interesting to see like from an from a strategic acquires perspective like you know when when you see a business that they the seller may not even know that it could be a, a strategic acquisition for you and how you sort of go about navigating you know with without enticing them to you know to play hardball um on the pricing side of things so yeah it's an interesting perspective that you brought there too but it's always a balancing act i guess I think one thing I want to say 
on deals I've been where I've tried to structure to make both sides happy is the seller has a fantastic product. They put a lot of sweat and tears and time and knowledge into something. Okay, they can't get it to where they need to in terms of monetization. We can create a win-win. So yeah, you're not gonna exit for a thousand dollars. I would never encourage a seller to do that. But there's certainly an opportunity where you can take some money off the table and keep some skin in the game with a buyer and leverage off their expertise, capital, network. Um, and I can imagine, Mario, you've explored some deal structures like that before in your time. Yeah, and that's a great reminder of going through experienced M&A advisors like you guys is really helpful because of structuring creative deals. Normally when, you know, let's say I want to buy a, I know, a supermarket, well, a supermarket's probably too large, but just a, a coffee shop nearby or so, just a local business, right? It's pretty simple. It's very hard to get creative and run different strategies of um, late payments or seller financing or like any other deals. Most of them are fairly straightforward, take it or leave it type of offers. And kind of what I've seen uh, working with M&A advisors uh, on Flip uh, essentially is finding a lot different opportunities that are, let's say, hey, you know, we can pay you this much right now, but you have the opportunity to earn back however much in the next 12 or 24 months. If you stick around, we're like buying you, but we are also going to pay you a salary in the next however much to stick around and keep growing the business and you take a portion of equity. It's almost like venture capital, but reverse, you know, in VC, normally someone, you know, gives you a lot of money, uh, takes 10% of the business, but sits on your cap table forever and dilutes you and pushes you to do something. Here, it's more about, you know, someone is taking over the business and the opportunity, but you can also stick around and keep growing and have some, almost like a sales commission structure afterwards. So I've seen a handful of these deals that are very interesting, especially in the financial acquisition space wherever the buyer doesn't necessarily have the skills or the know-how or the network and they need the seller to stick around for a while or even stick around forever. So these opportunities are very interesting. And back to the strategic acquisitions front, yes, strategic pays better, but finding a strategic buyer may or may not happen. Yeah. It may not be the right time, they may not be looking or anything. You know, It can take 12, 18, 24 months to find a strategic buyer versus a traditional financial deal closing in three to six months. And you probably have better numbers than I. Uh, but again, there's definitely a difference of whether you just want to sell and get rid of that, or maybe the business is in decline and you know it's going to get worse, so you just want to make sure you have everything packed and, and, and ready to go. Or you know, keep it as a cash cow, stay afloat and improve some financial metrics to prepare for a strategic acquisition with very specific businesses, very specific expectations, prepare your deal room and set everything straight for the for the transaction. Yeah, super good insight there, Mario. Um, I mean, follow up question to that, like what are the what are the common things that you see um, sellers making mistakes in in terms of like, you know, if you, let's say that you find a, a business that you'd like to acquire, you like it a lot, um, you want to acquire, you know, want to make it happen. What are some of the common things that sellers do that sort of basically tank a deal, or like, mm. make it or a maybe, maybe to even make it more kind of tangible? What was the last deal you you walked away from, and why? Um, maybe, of course, don't divulge don't the names. information, the names. the names. Yeah, yeah. But um, what was the last deal that you signed an LOI for, and walked away from? And why? Yeah. So, uh, a couple of specific examples, and they're kind of in the same category or so. But first off, as when it comes to tanking a deal, I see three different categories of problems. The first one is outright lying. You know that the business is tanking. You're trying to hide something, and this is the worst possible thing you can do. Yeah. Um, again, you can probably get away in a small transaction by someone just paying money for nothing, but it's very unlikely it happens. And you know. You also don't know what the consequences are going to be after, right? After all, you're sharing personal details, credentials, emails, and whatnot, so the person can actually, you know, sue you after or, you know, do something crazy, right? So outright lying is obviously a no-no in, in my playbook. The second thing is missing something 
mm, due to uh, out of sheer understanding of how the ecosystem works. For instance, someone built something for you, but you don't really have access to the hosting or they have they keep the intellectual property because you don't have your contact straight mm. or something like that. So yeah. this is this is a very painful one because the seller is well intentioned. It's it should be a good deal, but they actually cannot transfer everything that you need. Or it turns out it's an unsellable deal, or it just requires insurmountable efforts to to actually overcome that. So this is the second category, and the third one is simply making the transaction long and painful because you don't have everything set and uh, ready for the transfer, which is essentially the deal rule. Um, so th these are kind of the three categories. Um, and by everything in place, I mean access to domain names or you know hosting access through show. Like the best deals we have, they have a deal room or at least they have even like a, a Google account that you gain access to and then there's a Google Drive or a spreadsheet with all the passwords. So just everything set and forget. You receive the spreadsheet, you have all the links to all the tools, to billing, to hosting, to admin, to whatever it is, and, and, and that's it. It's simple and easy as that. So if you prepare yourself for that, it's it, it's a smooth transaction, and if people are on the fence, it makes it easier for them to actually acquire. In terms of transactions that, that I walked away from, they were in the second category. Uh, so both are publishers, and, and they're their SEO traffic was tanking. So they only had the last month of data, which was in decline, but it was January, so it was kind of on the fence, right? Q4 is a strong season, you get more traffic, January is slower, but it happens everywhere. Like people are just not browsing around in January, still taking breaks, still on vacation and so on. So it was kind of on the fence, even though I knew for both deals that this was the SEO algorithm, the helpful content update, kicking in and causing some damage there. So I knew that, I was fine with that, this was something that we can improve internally, so it's totally fine. However, both publishers, uh, one of them was in the um, life coaching space, just motivational speaking, you know, living a better life, better relationships, better communication, so forth. And it was a nice cash cow I would get in. I just like, you know, keeping people positive, giving them extra resource to, you know, uh, decrease depression and things like that. So. Not something I'm going to do for a living, but a good side project to make me feel better and also keep growing and have some writers write about. So this is one of them. The other one was something in the investment space, I think. So financial advice, tips, strategies, talk, and, and so forth. So both were good deals. Both were around 45,000, I think, asking price, making around two grand, between 1,300 and 2,100 a month in reported profit from ads. And I knew that, you know, payback time, roughly speaking, 80 months or so. Again, roughly speaking. So both were good deals in my playbook that I would buy. However, uh, during the due diligence, I realized that both businesses were using Mediavine for ad management. And Mediavine's official terms of service and their policy claims that even during a business acquisition, transferring the ad account is... Uh, yes. and mm -hmm. buyers have to set up their own account. However, the buying process has very high thresholds of ongoing traffic, trailing 12 months and different things. Plus, both of these accounts had slightly better terms due to accrued you know, commissions and being kind of loyal buyers and they had uh, a, a better network that a new buyer setting up a new account is not going to be able to match. So in that case, the deal was actually unsellable uh, unless the seller goes through the hoops of either making it happen with media buying support, like, hey, you know, we're just going to transfer the email account, so it's still kind of falling in line with the policy, or transitioning to a different ads provider and kind of retaining terms that they have right now so that they make the transition possible. And again, this is something that may actually tank a deal so you may have all the access in the world or all the systems, but it doesn't mean these are transferable and these are sellable. And if they're not, essentially you're selling a, a website that's generating zero revenue once picked up by a buyer. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> I mean, in saying that, I, I guess some of the key takeaways for those that might be listening and looking to sell is like, a, a lot a lot of buyers, especially in a certain price range, let's call it, you know, five figures and above, like this isn't their first radio and they're handing over cash, right? So, yeah. you know, trying to bullshit your way 
through <laughs> trying to sell a business is not going to work. Um, and in fact, you're probably doing yourself a disservice because, you know, uh, highlighting some of the key um, key sort of strengths and some of the key weaknesses could actually open up an opportunity for someone like Mario who, you know, if, if there's a problem that they're facing um, that they haven't been able to solve, but Mario can solve it in, you know, two seconds, then that actually is a, is a great uh, opportunity for someone like Mario or like or whatnot. And then the second thing is just generally being organized with, you know, the the data and especially <laughs> time and time again, uh, financials seem to be the the uh, Achilles heels uh, <laughs> for most people. But, you know, having that organized and, you know, if you're trying to do it yourself, like that is a big job. You know, that is something that's definitely, um, you know, not an easy, uh, easy thing to do. But, you know, when you partner with the right people um, and they know what buyers are looking for then, you know, you can get that organized um, and leverage the expertise on that. But, yeah, really, really good points that you brought up there. And, you know, I'm sure there's been plenty of other examples of Category 1 that you've come across. Um, but, unfortunately, you can't, you can't, fil- you can't filter out uh, those kind of players, uh, ultimately. Uh, I mean, uh, some specific categories that are very obvious and I can definitely call out, not necessarily names, but examples is... Uh, newer products alive for like six months or so uh, and then you know they've been around for six months and kind of flip a list them down as average monthly profit uh, let's say one grand a month right so they generated in theory six grand over the past six months and it's just spread out split up by six months essentially what they did is they launched something on product hub and AppSumo. They closed lifetime deals for 199 forever lifetime deal <laughs> yeah you yeah, know, closed yeah. 40 of these and then they generated a profit and now you know they, they, they don't have a funnel they don't have ongoing clients and not only that but you actually have to support that revenue forever if you pick up the business sounds um, like a, another platform that I'm thinking of but I won't name names um, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah anyway but yeah no that's really good I mean it's just I, I don't know I, I, they, they, sometimes there's a bit of like um ignorance like in terms of like actually you know what they need to do in terms of like s- selling mm-hmm. a business and generally you know, human nature is going to be like you know sharing everything that's positive and good and like trying to really sell the business right but you know it, exploring the weaknesses and, and bringing up some of the you know challenges within the business can be very uh very mm-hmm. beneficial i think also what you alluded to there mario about businesses which are selling these lifetime deals they need to be very careful because I think at the time when they're doing it, they don't think ahead and they might think, okay, cash flow now is really good because I'm getting these lifetime signups, but this is actually future liabilities in the future for an exit, uh, for, for someone that is going to buy the business in the future and these customers. So again, to reiterate, if you're a seller and you're thinking, a shortcut way is to provide these great lifetime deals for your subscribers. Actually, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, while the short term gain of the cash flow is really good, maybe for that month and that uptick in, in customer signups, within three or four months, a bio is going to see that straight away. And it's actually going to be a future liability um, against you. So I think that's a really good. Um, kind of point that you made earlier about these, you know, AppSumo, for example, or um, these other kind of during your DD, you notice these things. Yeah. And again, like we come with the, with good intentions first. So I'm pretty sure yeah, that everyone course. listening on the show who is potentially selling low intentions because they're not doing some shady stuff and they're exactly uh, sellers. My point here is that buyers, are facing a lot of these deals on the market and that's what makes them extra careful and that's what those tanking most deals it's more about you know the good people should not be hurt or you know affected by what's happening out there from people who are not good intentioned but if sellers are aware of whatever else exists on the market it would help them craft a better offer or probably provide better transparency of where is revenue coming from and so forth 
Um, again, like Flippa provides lots of opportunities to take a look at, like uh, one clear example, the, the SEMrush integration, I love it. Uh, my agency, Devrix, is a SEMrush agency partner, so we've run these reports anyways, but them integrating Flippa is amazing. And, you know, a business that claims to have organic growth and having a domain authority of one or two and five ranked keywords is obviously fake. It's just mm. straight out of the door, takes two seconds to figure this out. Or a business that's claiming to target the US audience, but then you see that organic traffic is coming from, I know, Afghanistan or whatever, right? Like outside of North America. So you just see this and it clicks that something's off here. And again, some of these fake deals are easier to track down. The good news is that it's also easier to double check and kind of go through the checklist. And when you see a real deal, you see, okay, real website, domain authorities, 20, 30, whatever, check, looks like a real site. Keywords ranked, 1500, okay. There's content on it, it's been ranking there for a while. Traffic seems organic is fine and so on and so on. So the good news is that when you come across a decent business, you know there are lots of shady deals and it's easier to increase your chances by literally doing nothing just because most buyers are aware of what's off and they just tick off boxes when they see that it isn't off mm -hmm. for you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more about not tanking the deal due to uh, misunderstanding or lack of access or something else in your end. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Well, like to um, to wrap things up, like I, I want to sort of give you a bit of a, uh, I guess a promo or like a buyer mandate off the cuff here. So like, let's say yeah, right now you're looking for the perfect business that you want to acquire uh, right now. Like, what what would that business look like, and what are you what are you looking for uh, at the moment? Because there might be someone listening that has this. So, um, that's that's great. To be fair, that's nothing in particular. It's more about I'm always open to great opportunities, but I'm going to list down several specific considerations that I have. One of them is the content sites that I mentioned, something with recurring revenue from ads that hasn't tanked uh, at least a thousand bucks a month in ad profit is something that is of interest. Like I can buy 10 of these and have, you know, 10K uh, MRR from that portfolio of sites and we can use it for other things. So this is one great example. Like if you have a content publishing website with decent uh, content that's ranked on Google and has organic traffic from uh, ads or you know subscriptions or show anything that's relatable and is not going to churn away right away, that's great. So that's one category that I'm looking for. Uh, I'm also looking for small agencies. We're uh, talking two or three people in strategic markets, North America, Australia, all sorts of digital, like creative, SEO, uh, videography or so. So it's like small teams that you know they have the skills and stuff. They have a probably small portfolio, two, three, four, five clients that are situated in a specific market and are willing to, like, we can use it to, to kind of exploit that market and just have presence there from day one instead of, you know, starting from scratch and bring, building brand awareness and stuff. That's the second category. Number three is creative use cases with AI. I cannot just diminish AI because it's everywhere, but we see very interesting use cases of AI doing business plans or conversion rate optimization reviews or user experience reports and other automated stuff with a higher quality that we can just uh, use as a lead generation funnel or so for existing plans or just add it on top of our retainer list and monthly reports and so forth. So these are kind of three pretty simple categories that I can think of and there are others that I'm also looking for for um, our clients and partners and others that are looking for small acquisitions or mid-sized acquisitions themselves. Well, there you go, folks. Really so helpful. if you got a business like that, uh, hit up Dom or Mario, preferably yeah. Dom first, so we can uh, work through with Mario. <laughs> but yeah. hey, we're not, uh, we're, we're agnostic here. So we're here for reach education. Out, so, uh, yeah. Reach out to Mario and Dominic. Um, hey, mate, yeah. uh, always, always be closing, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, um, I was just going to say, Kristen, before you uh, wrap up there, I also have one more question for Mario that we always ask our, our guests. Yeah. Um, so every guest we have on the panel, uh, Mario, I'm always curious, um, what is the most interesting book you've read recently uh, or podcast you've listened to where you've got something out of it? It doesn't have to be business related, by the way. It could be mindfulness. It could be also fiction. I'm always curious to hear from our uh, panel okay. members. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's definitely not just one. I have a, a list of both books and podcasts. Um, I'm... 
uh, one that's probably relevant is the, the collection by Hormozy for $100 million offers and $100 million leads. Both books are pretty great. And I'm recommending that because first off, they're packed with value. And second, for sellers, they actually need to build an offer for their listing. So mm. they need to design and devise the right offer for the listing. So learning how to create the offer, which is um, essentially the formula for an offer, roughly speaking, is uh, top value, like promises of the bright future, uh, multiplied by odds to get there, meaning 99% chance this is going to happen, divided by friction and cost. So like if you make it affordable, incredible opportunities, 100% chance to get there, and almost frictionless, just transfer the keys and you get there, that's an outstanding offer. So this is kind of one example. Another one that I'm very passionate about podcast-wise is the B2B Revenue Vitals by Chris Walker from, um, well, he's running several companies actually, uh, but it, it's really talking about the misconceptions in marketing nowadays, and it's definitely revealing in 2024 for how attribution fails, how the previous models of PPC aren't working very well, demand generation is going to restriction and so on. So if your playbooks aren't working right now and you still need to improve your EBITDA, go and listen in and you're going to calibrate some things, improve your financial forecasts and models internally, and it's going to set you up for a better sale after. That's absolute fire. I'm a big Alex Almozy fan as well, and I never really sort of linked the two together of like, you know, listings for sale, actually having an offer within that, making it like easy, instant results as little friction as possible uh, with the big promise that can be delivered on. That's uh, that's absolute fire, Mario. Love it. I honestly, I've seen listings just, you know, an autopilot business for you, you know, one K a month recurring revenue. Again, autopilot could be ran for like five years. No need to touch it. Defensible business model, strong motor. Like as an example, right? If that turns out to be true and that's the start of the listing, Man, competition and bidding for that is going to be crazy. I can see you sweating for it right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> literally. Awesome. Well, look, it was, uh, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, where, where can people um, connect with you if they want to sort of learn more about what you're up to and uh, with, what's the best way to see, see what you're doing? Absolutely. Mario Peshev on LinkedIn is the best place to go. Just uh, make sure you add to the comments that you uh, listen to the show because I do ignore blank, non-personalized invites. Uh, also, I'm on Twitter. Uh, again, look up Mario Peshev and my website, surprisingly, is mariopeshev.com. So feel free right. to pick any of the mediums and more than happy to see you there. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again and uh, look forward to uh, connecting with you some point in, uh, in the near future, man.